Okay, thanks for coming so early in the morning. Um, I'll try to make it worth your while for waking up. Uh, we're going to talk about um, SOA formation in the oil sands region of Alberta. So, for those of you that don't know, uh, the oil sands are located in northern Alberta, Canada. And as the name suggests, oil sands are, mi are a mix of sand, water, clay, but most importantly, bitumen. Because it's this bitumen that's recovered um, through open pit mining or in-situ drilling, ultimately upgraded and, and turned to crude oil. So um, as of January this year, there are more than 100 active oil sands projects in Alberta. And it's expected by 2022 that crude bitumen production is going to more than double. Although at today's oil prices, I'm not so sure. So this is a, an aerial overview of the, of the oil sands region. There's about uh, almost 5,000 square kilometers of, of mineable area, of which about 1,300 square kilometers is being, mi being mined right now. There's also mine pits, there's tailings ponds, there's upgrading facilities on site, uh, and all of these have their own unique emissions, which we set out to try and measure. So we did this. We mounted an aircraft campaign uh, in the summer of 2013 the objectives of which included things like measuring um, criteria, air contaminants, of course, that goes without saying, um, in the region to provide data for satellite validation, ultimately to evaluate and, and hopefully improve our high resolution air quality models. And most importantly for this talk is to, to understand the transport and the transformation of, of oil sands uh, pollutants and, and how they convert to, to SOA. So, with this in mind, there were 22 flights, about 84 hours of uh, vomit-inducing flight. Uh, and four flights in particular were used to study the transformation of oil sands emissions and the SOA formation. So this is how we did it. This is a Convair 580. Uh, and it was instrumented with a number of different gas and particle phase instru instruments, um, things like a PTR TOF MS for VOCs. Uh, high resolution AMS for particle composition, SP2 for black carbon, uh, acid SIMS, and then of course the, um, the standard 3D winds, lat long, and so on. These are the transformation flights in particular that I was, that I was uh, mentioning before. Um, I'll only be talking a little bit about flight 19 and 20 today. And uh, essentially what we did is we flew cross sections across um, the major oil sands plumes perpendicular to the to the wind direction. And uh, these cross sections incorporated most of the major oil sands operations. So by looking at, um, at these screens, we get a good idea of, of how the overall emissions from the oil sands are being transformed downwind. And so we followed these large scale plumes for uh, probably more than 120 kilometers or so. We did this in a Lagrangian way. And what do we see? So this is um, flight 19 although the results are, are generally similar for all the transformation flights, we see that there are two large-scale uh, plumes associated with oil sands operations. One is, is VOC rich, which um, I'm just showing in black, toluene as a representative hydrocarbon, and another plume which is uh, SO2 rich in, in red here. So they're more or less uh, separate from each other, although they do mix a little bit, um, but what you see at intercept number two, which is about uh, probably about 60, maybe 50 kilometers away from the operations, is that it's already dominated by organic aerosol, which is shown here in the green. Uh, and even, even about uh, 40 minutes away, you've got about 75 to 85 percent organic aerosol. So the question is, is this primary or secondary uh, organic aerosol? And in order to, to get a handle on that, we of course perform PMF, which is uh, standard in the AMS community. And our best possible solution was a two-factor solution, uh, both of which were fairly uh, oxygenated. So it's an indication to us that at the end of the day, these, these plumes, the organics in these plumes are secondary in nature. And we could not isolate a factor that's uh, hydrocarbon-like or HOA, which is usually associated with a primary aerosol. So these two factors, I'm showing them here. There was a, a more fresh factor and a more aged factor. Um, and as it turns out, that they're, they're very, very similar to the, to the spectra you would see in chamber studies of alpha pinene or other terpene SOA. The fresh one looked a lot like uh, OH uh, alpha pinene SOA after about an hour, and the more age factor um, was, looked like a, a spectra from about six hours. This is, these are uh, 
I'm not showing the comparison spectra, but it, they're, they're very similar to what's in the literature and our own chamber experiments as well. So uh, on the surface, it looks like the SOA is, is mostly biogenic. Uh, and if you look at the time series of these factors as a function of intercept through these plumes, going from intercept one to four, four being furthest away, you find that within the plume, factor two is dominant, uh, which is blue and, and in the shaded gray part. And factor one is more important outside the plume although it does start to build in um, the further away you, you go. And you'll notice that in the red boxes, the monoterpenes and isoprene as measured by the PTRMS are actually higher outside of the plume uh, to the far west where we know there are no oil sands operations. And yet the, the amount of SOA you, you see um, doesn't really change. So on the surface, it looks like the SOA within this plume is, is mostly biogenic and enhanced by the oil sands emissions, maybe the NOx or the oxidants. But of course, there's a caveat that if the oil sands facilities themselves are emitting things that look like terpenes, as, at least according to the PTRMS, um, and as you'll see, it's very likely, then of course all bets are off, and this could be um, from the facilities themselves. But in either case, the oil sands emissions are accounting for this SOA, either through providing the precursor or um, providing the, the oxidant and NOx, of course. So I mentioned that oil sands activities can emit biogenic-like compounds. This is just showing a, a, a box flight around one particular facility, um, showing measurements from the PTRMS. And what we find is that toluene, which we know is, a, is an emission from the oil sands, is enhanced on the northern side. This is the red arrow indicates the wind direction. And so obviously nothing is coming into the box, but it's all leaving the box. So that implies that, of course, it's coming from, from this operation. And the same can be said, in fact, for the terpenes. Um, and isoprene, which I'm not showing. So um, it's not surprising then that, that the SOA that we see in the, these large oil sands plumes, in fact, appears to be biogenic. But um, I guess you could argue that maybe it still is biogenic as a matter of fresh uh, living trees versus two million year old trees, but they're all trees. We could argue that later, I suppose. We looked at the SOA formation rate. We did this um, using the uh, background subtracted organic to CO ratios has been, has been done quite a few times in the literature. Uh, and so how this ratio changes, of, changes as a function of photochemical age is an indication that SOA formation is occurring. So we can see here that the, the organic to CO ratio increases as a function of photochemical age, which is derived from the NOx and OI ratios and our estimated OH concentration. And so um, in a few hours, we can almost triple the amount of SOA that we're, that we're forming. And if you put this in context a little bit, um, which is what I'm doing at the bottom here, uh, you see that the organic to CO ratio increases um, by about a factor of three or so, quite quickly, as I mentioned. But um, in relation to these other studies, so in New England, London, Paris, Mexico, um, generally this evolution occurs over about a day or so. Um, but in the oil sands, it tends to occur a lot faster. Now, this, this uh, drop-off in the ratio that you see on the top, we don't think that's real. We think it's because we're making secondary CO, which under normal circumstances doesn't make much of a difference. But when the oil sands is only emitting a little bit of CO, um, even 5 ppb uh, can depress that slope. So uh, we think that black carbon is a better indicator, a better tracer, dilution tracer because the, the background levels are more stable and it's, of course, conserved. So what I'm showing you is the same plot, the organic to black carbon uh, ratio this time as a function of photochemical age. And again, of course, they are related and you do increase, you do make SOA, of course. And again, putting it in context, in a relative sense, flights 19 and 20 uh, fall in here in the gray section. And a few studies that I was able to find in Paris and Tokyo where they use black carbon as a tracer uh, fall down here. So um, you can see that you, in, a pretty, in pretty short order, you can have a 500 to 800 percent increase in the amount of SOA formed in the oil sands compared to how uh, slowly it evolves in urban outflow over about a day or so. This is pretty significant, I think. Um, finally, we looked at the absolute amount of SOA mass being formed, and we did this using an algorithm developed within our group and almost ready to submit. And it essentially uses aircraft data to calculate an emission from a box flight. So everything coming in the box, uh, what comes out the box minus what goes in the box must be what is being emitted. And it does this by interpolating between uh, flight paths. Uh, 
And what we did in this case is just calculate the flux through one wall of this box, um, or a screen, which is what I'm showing here. And if you subtract the two screens, the mass here and the mass here, the difference is the amount of SOA being formed within that, those two screens. So we did that for flight 19. Here's what you see. You can pretty clearly see the oil sands plumes in each of these screens, and they are uh, building and, and getting bigger. And if you integrate the concentration in these red boxes and then subtract them, you get an idea, an idea of the SOA being formed. So that's what we did. Oh, and by the way, we can be losing, and we are losing, some mass out of the top of the screen, which I cannot control. That's just how high we, f we happen to fly. Um, so when you subtract them, what you see, you get about a, a one to two tons or so of SOA being formed per hour. And you can actually subdivide it into left side of left plume, right plume, and so on. But um, overall, there's about one to two tons per hour being formed. And if you compare this to what industry reports as primary PM2.5, um, we find that our integrated, overall integrated SOA formation rate, which is about uh, 3.4 tons an, an hour or so over that um, entire flight, is about four times larger than all the PM2.5 being reported um, from, from the industry. And it's probably, a, a, it's about 13 times uh, greater than the primary PM2.5 from all the major stacks, from stationary sources. So pretty clearly SOA is an important, um, important part of the, the mix here. Uh, in conclusion, one, the, uh, the SOA in these oil sands plumes can be from the enhancement of regional biogenic, but it's probably more likely that it's the oxidation of things that look like biogenics within that plume. In either case, it's the oil sands that's accounting for the significant amount of SOA, either providing the precursor or providing um, the oxidant and the NOx, or providing both. Um, two, the SOA formation in these plumes is highly, highly efficient, probably one of the most efficient that uh, we've seen thus far, uh, at least based on the organic to black carbon or organic to CO ratio. And finally, um, the 3.4 tons an hour of SOA that we formed downwind in about 120 kilometers or so is quite a bit higher than all of the primary emissions in that region, and it implies, of course, that SOA formation is one of the most important contributors to PM2.5 in the region, and we need to be getting this correct in, in air quality models. And with that, I thank you. Thank you, John. Do we have any questions? Not in these flights, no. No, there might have been some new particle formation maybe early on in a box flight right near the source as emissions cool off, uh, but not new particle formation downwind, no.